Welcome to the Progressive Learning Platform Instruction Breakdown and Data Path Tutorial. In this tutorial, we will show you the different types of instructions and break them down to see why they are different. We will discuss the 32 bit size that all instructions share. We will look at what a pseudo operation is. And lastly, we will follow a handful of the instructions through the processor's data path. As you can see in how we write our instructions in assembly, there are some similarities in the syntax for different instructions. If we look at an add instruction, for example, we know that there are four parts of its syntax. The first part being the instruction name, the second being the destination register, and the third and fourth being the source register. When the instruction is read by the assembler, these four fields define values in the instruction that determine the path that the instruction takes through the processor. Here is another way to write the same instruction using the register numbers rather than the name. This will help demonstrate where they fit into the instruction breakdown. In the case of an R-type instruction, the 32-bit word that the assembler turns our code into contains six parts or fields, each necessary at different stages of instruction execution. The first field are six bits for the opcode. The opcode is part of what determines which processor components will be utilized while performing the add operation. The assembler knows which opcodes to use for which instructions and the opcode controller in the processor knows how to handle each opcode generated so we never have to manually manage what value is stored here. After the opcode the two source registers follow each five bits. Then there are five bits for the destination register. 5 bits is used for all parts of an instruction that stores a register number because the possible values in a 5 bit number are 0 through 31, which is exactly the number of registers in our register file. Next, we have 5 bits for the shift amount, which is not used by add and therefore would just be 0. The last field, function, is used to define which function will be performed on the registers. This layout is an R type. Being that the bit pattern used by an instruction is based solely on how the instruction needs to be processed, we can see that whether any other instruction is an R-type is not because of its logical functionality, but rather which components in the processor it utilizes. There are three total types of instructions, the others being I-type and J-type. While some similar operations are of the same type, add, subtract, for example, we have to keep in mind that their logical operation is not what places them in the category. An add immediate, for example, is an I type, and so even though an add and an add immediate both add two numbers, it is the source of those two numbers that gives them a different type. The determining factor for what places them in the category is solely based on their encoding. Add and subtract are of the same instruction type simply because the bit segments of their corresponding 32 bits need to go to the same locations in the processor. All of PLP's instructions are 32 bits in length. This provides us with enough information to handle a very large amount of operations, but there are limitations. If we look at the layout of the immediate instruction, we can clearly see that it only has enough room for 16 bits in the immediate field. We have used load immediate quite a bit without addressing exactly why it still works load all 32 bits of an argument that we pass to it. Load immediate is actually a pseudo op that performs two instructions because of the fact that the immediate field can only hold half of the argument that we pass to load immediate. It first uses the actual hardware instruction load upper immediate, then performs an or immediate on the second half of the initial argument to finish the load immediate instruction. There are many pseudo-ops that perform similarly and that they utilize the hardware's instructions to accomplish a more complex task. If the instruction set architecture wasn't RISC, there would likely be an instruction that handles this directly, but the RISC paradigm and its name aims at reducing the number of instructions in the instruction set. This is the reason that pseudo-ops exist. Another pseudo-op that we've used frequently is no-op. There really is no hardware instruction to perform nothing. So the no-op performs the instruction shift left logical to the zero register, contents of the zero register, zero times. This is what we use to fill branch delay slots. The pseudo-op 
doesn't combine instructions to perform its intended behavior, but it serves as a way to make the programming a little easier and more intuitive while still being assembled in what the simulator and hardware need. While there are limitations to using registers that only contain 32 bits, they can be overcome by the use of pseudo-op. The first instruction type that we will examine through the data path will be the R type. As we step through how each part of the instruction is utilized by various components, it is important to note that the hardware does not execute the instruction in the step-by-step -step fashion that we, we will be examining them. These steps will be happening concurrently and inherent delays in the hardware will ensure that data is where it needs to be when it is needed. For this R-type step through, we will use an add instruction. The first thing that the processor must do with this and all instructions is to load the instruction from memory from the address stored in the program counter. This address is also used to calculate the address of the next instruction which we will discuss later. From here, let's break this instruction down and see how each part is utilized. Let's first look at the opcode, bits 31 through 26. As you can see, this is what goes to the control unit, which decode the bits and essentially set up which path will be used. The reg destination needs to be sent a high signal because this is what tells the multiplexer that feeds the register file that three registers are being used. Since we have an ALU operation to perform, addition in this case, the ALU op must also be set to high to signify to the ALU control unit what data needs to be passed to the ALU. The control unit will also have to send a high signal on the reg write to notify the register file that there will be resulting data that needs to be written to a register. The jump and the branch must both be low signals since neither of these functionalities are being used. Mem read, mem to reg, and mem write will all be set to low since there is no memory manipulation in this instruction. Lastly, ALU source will be a low signal. This is what tells the MUX that feeds the second argument to the ALU which piece of data will be utilized. The next part of the instruction, bits 25 through 21, indicate which register's data will be read and used as the first argument passed to the ALU. For this walkthrough, we will say that there is a 5 stored in this register. Bits 20 through 16 indicate which register's data will be read and used as the second argument passed to the ALU. We will say that there is a 3 stored in this register. For bits 15 through 11, since the control unit sent a high signal to this MUX, will indicate which register will have the results of the operation written to when calculated. Bits 5 through 0 are passed through the ALU control unit to signal to the ALU that an addition operation is needed. This is the function part of the instruction. Subtraction, for example, uses the exact components as addition and therefore has the same opcode. The function gives us a way to keep everything the same and only change what the ALU needs to do. Now that we can see how the data path is set up by decoding the instruction, we can look at what happens to the result of the operation. We already saw that a low signal is sent to the data memory, so that will not be utilized. And also that a low signal was sent to this MUX. So we now have the data that needs to be written and the register that that data needs to be written to. Since the reg write was enabled, the data will be written to that register. We have now seen all of the components used to execute an addition or R-type instruction, though there is still one more thing that needs to be discussed, which is getting the next instruction in the program. We previously saw that when the address of the next instruction is read, the address is also sent to the input of an adder that adds 4 to it. Since the system is byte addressable, adding 4 to the current address gives us the address that is 32 bits away, or the next instruction. Since neither of the two MUX along this path were sent a high signal, the address plus 4 is what gets loaded into the program counter as the address of the next instruction. 
We will now look at a different type of instruction to see how the hardware handles it differently. Let's look at a jump or jump to label. The R type as seen in the previous step through uses the most registers of any instruction while the jump uses none. Also, jump uses a label which the hardware does not understand so when the program is assembled a jump label must be converted to a memory address so that the hardware is able to perform the operation. A jump instruction, as with all instructions, is fetched into instruction memory by reading the address currently in the program counter, as well as a plus four increment occurs on that address. The opcode, bits 31 through 26, is decoded by the control unit and the jump is sent a high signal. This toggles the MUX that is to be utilized by the jump instruction. Since a jump uses no registers, no memory, and performs no ALU calculations, no other components need to be utilized and therefore jump is the only high signal set by the control unit. Now we look at bits 25 through 0, which contain the address that the assembler had converted our label to when the program was assembled. We will look at this in hex since that is the format that we have been viewing addresses in for clarity. The problem here is that a red address needs to be 32 bits in length and at this point there are only 26 remaining in the instruction. What happens is that when the assembler converts the label to an address that the four most significant bits are truncated and the hardware will then reuse those bits from the previous instruction. This can happen because the amount of addresses available dictates that no jump can extend into those four most significant bits. Now we have 30 bits of the address and the other two bits can be truncated on the least significant side, meaning that any jump address allocated by the assembler will have a zero zero as the two least significant bits indicating that it is a multiple of four which ensures that the byte addressable memory remains organized in four byte pieces which is the size of an instruction. The rest of the path is straightforward. The MUX that is sent a high signal from the control unit allows the reconstructed address to then be loaded into the program counter. As you can see a jump instruction uses significantly less hardware than an add instruction does. Now we will look at an instruction branch that is similar in functionality to a jump. The functional difference between the two is that a branch will only jump to a label if a condition is met. In PLP, the condition that we can use is equality. We can branch on equal or we can branch on not equal. Like all instructions, the address in the PC is read for the next instruction and the control unit decodes the opcode. The control unit sends a high signal on branch, which goes to this AND gate, which we will look at further in a moment. The ALU op is also set to high since there needs to be a conditional check, specifically if the data in the two registers is equal. That is all the components that the control unit needs to activate and the rest of the signals from the control unit are set to low. The data in the two registers in the 25 to 21 and 20 to 16 bits of the instruction need to be compared. Therefore, the data is read and used as two inputs to the ALU. If the condition did not pass, the address in the program counter would just be incremented by four and the rest of the instruction would not be utilized. Let's continue on as if we know the condition will pass. The ALU would then send a signal to the AND gate that allows the MUX that the branch instruction uses as a toggle to signify that the condition passed. Since the condition passed, the PC needs to be loaded with the address that the assembler assigned to the label specified in the code, just like the jump instruction. The difference here is that we only have the 16-bit immediate field, which I will convert to hex for better readability as this is an I-type instruction remaining in the instruction. We cannot reuse parts of the previous address like in a jump because it would not give us nearly enough range in what addresses we could use. 
in the case of a branch, the assembler just calculates how far instruction wise the branch needs to jump to get to the label's address. The value is then sign extended to make it 32 bits and then shifted left twice to convert our distance to bytes since our addresses are all byte addressable. This number is then added to the incremented address of the current instruction, thereby loading the PC with the address that is associated with the label in the code. The final instruction that we will look at is another I-type, store word. Even though we have just seen branch, which is also an I-type, Store word utilizes the only component that none of the others have thus far, memory. Again, the opcode, bits 31 through 26, is decoded by the control unit in order to activate the components required by store word. Since part of the instruction is adding an offset, 12 in this example, to a memory address stored in the register, we know that the AOU will be utilized. Since we are storing something, we know that the processor will be writing to memory and therefore is sent a high signal. Store word also sends a high signal to the MUX that acts as a toggle for the second ALU input. We will examine this further in a moment. The control unit sends low signals on the remaining lines out since no other components are necessary. Bits 25 through 21 is the register that contains the address where the data will be stored. This register gets read and passed as an input to the ALU. Bits 20 through 16 indicate the register that contains the data that needs to be written to memory. This register gets read, and the data is used as the write data input of the memory unit. The immediate field, which is the offset specified in the code, is extended to 32 bits since it is going to the ALU. Let's display this in hex form for simplicity. Since the control unit activated this MUX, the offset is the other input to the ALU. The ALU adds the destination address with the offset and the result is used as the address that specifies to the memory unit the location to store the desired data. Now that we have the data to be written to memory, the memory location that the data is to be stored and that the control unit sent a high signal to the memory unit that data is to be stored to memory, the path for this instruction is complete. Now we just need to show that the program counter was also updated with the plus four increment needed for the next instruction. And that concludes this tutorial. Thank you for watching.